Hey everyone. Hey everyone. Good afternoon, good morning to you from wherever it is that you are joining me from. My name is Barton Siever and uh, yeah, hey, I really appreciate you. Thanks for being a part of my day. Uh, hey, I'm a chef, I'm an author, I'm a proud resident of the delicious jagged coast of Maine with my wife, my two boys, kid squid, little mackerel, uh, my 15 chickens, and uh, yeah, life is good. The seasons are turning here, the flavors of, of autumn and winter are starting to, uh, to really feel right. We've got all the squash coming in, we've got the garden being put to rest, flavors like roasted garlic just beginning to make a whole lot of sense to me, rosemary, sage, right? Yeah, I mean, starting to get you going here. Yeah, that's what we're thinking about these days. I've been, you know, I've turned back to red wine as well, just, hey, these are the warming flavors and things that we give thanks for, right? So, as any of you who have joined me uh, in these webinars before, uh, welcome back. But as many of you know, I like to at least, well, I like to start off with sharing something that I am grateful for because, well, gratitude is an incredibly powerful thing when we show it, right? So, uh, next week, my wife is returning to the traditional workforce for the first time in 13 years. She has been the principal of her own graphic design company and very successful in that. We've done a number of books together, but she is in fact going back uh, to take on a, a, a really fun position as pretty much like an art director for a really great company called the Maine Beer Company here in uh, the state, uh, just a mile up the road. So, hey, now it's nepotism. It used to just be like, hey, check out my, my great friends and neighbors uh, at the Maine Beer Company. And, and hey, now it's nepotism. Check out my wife's company up there, Maine Beer Co. So she uh, carved up a pumpkin here with their logo in it. So I'm giving thanks for that today. That's what I wanted to express my gratitude for. Her. I'm really excited for her and uh, excited also to be spending time with my boys in the afternoons when she's at work. So anyway. There we are. I'd love for you to share with me anything that you are grateful for, or if not with us here in the group, well, just reflect on it yourself. Because as you know, times are a little bit crazy right now, right? A little bit of anxiety. Yeah. So gratitude. It's a good thing. Also, because of the fact that we're talking about food, feeding people is an act of love. It is an act of kindness. And so... That's why I always like to start off with that little gratitude meditation, if you will. But today's topic is cooking whole fish. Cooking whole fish is a really fun uh, way to cook anything. It's really elegant in this preparations, presentations, but also it's way easier than you think it might be. I mean, it's just like cooking filet fish pretty much, except you have a little bit longer times and you just have different means to remove it from the trays, etc. But nothing in itself is too complicated. So on the right hand side of the screen here, you're going to see a whole list of uh, questions that you can com comment in on or, or add comments to whatever it is I'm saying or any of our other uh, attendees are saying. So please be active there. Ask me any questions. Anything is open from uh, vegetarian, vegan cuisine to tilapia, unicorns, you name it, whatever else, eh, anything in life really, willing to talk about it all. So with that, I'm going to spend the first couple of minutes here talking about a couple of preparations that I've got going on to show you a few things. And then I'm going to get some things going in the oven and we'll take some questions and then we'll get back to you as well. All right. So with that, let's dive in. The first thing I want to dive into is seasoning whole fish. So, because you're cooking the whole thing, oftentimes with the skin on, seasoning the fish tends to happen after the fact of cooking. If you're salt roasting a fish, which we'll go through, the salt doesn't actually permeate the flesh. So, afterwards, it's nice to season it with some you know, crunchy, flaky salt, like a maldon, something that has some presence to it while also seasoning. If you are poaching, as I've got a, a whole pollock being poached here, whole pollock, really cool. Um, the poaching liquid is going to infuse some seasoning to the fish. So uh, with that, I like to just pre-season the cavity of the fish a little bit, allowing it to uh, be drawn into the flesh. But really, again, you're sort of uh, seasoning after the fact. And then the, one of the, the other preparations that we'll talk about today is foil roasting, which is... Well, it's basically in papillote, trapping all of the vapors from the fish 
inside of a sort of sealed packet. And again, all those juices stay in there. So with that, I do actually like to season the fish on the outside so that those juices, as they uh, you know evaporate and then fall back down onto the fish, kind of self-basting it, well, they take off some of that salt and season themselves from the outside of the fish. So with that also, another thing to mention is that, well, as I said, oftentimes you're cooking the whole fish with the skin on. And you have to pretty much for structural integrity. The skin is a great tool. It also helps to add or deepen flavor in the flesh. But oftentimes you're not going to eat the skin because, well, steamed fish skin uh, in most preparations, it's, it's just not really that kind of culinarily appealing. It's, it's just kind of soft textured and doesn't add a whole lot. doesn't take anything away, but in my opinion, it's best to then remove it post fact. So, uh, again, that's why one of the reasons why seasoning on the outside isn't going to work because you're just basically going to be removing that seasoning later on. So, let's talk about salt roasting fish. Now, many of you have seen this technique before, certainly have heard of it, I imagine, uh, but this is a great way of cooking fish that, again, sort of traps in the vapors in a salt crust uh, while keeping the fish very, very moist because of that, but also intensifying, augmenting the flavors through that self-steaming process. So I've seen a couple of questions about what are the very best fish to roast, and while we're talking about this method, well, let's talk about some of the pan fish, or what I call fillet fish, in terms of a category. So here we're talking red snapper, striped bass, we're talking black bass, as I've got in front of us here. Uh, you're talking about Pacific rockfish, you're talking about uh, some forms of grouper. The smaller fish that yield about one portion per fillet, right? Or as a smaller fish like this, this uh, the black sea bass, that might be a single portion. Bronzino is another one that you oftentimes see. It's very classic preparation in Greek and for Mediterranean Italian cuisine. So uh, with that, I was hoping to get some Bronzino today, but you know, instead, I mean, hey, Neptune sent up some delicious, absolutely fabulous black bass instead. So that's what we've got. So with the black bass, stand up here and move it a little bit closer to you so you can see. Um, Beautiful fish, about uh, just bigger than my hand. Uh, where are we? There we are. The, the body of the fish is about the size of my hand, and then you've got the head on. Now, you can remove the head if you'd like. Just, hey, if you don't like your fish looking at you, fine, I get it. I totally get it. But to me, it heightens the appeal of the whole preparation, the presentation, as well as it helps to add flavor. And out of respect for the animal and sustainability, hey, there's a lot of little bitey, dip, tasty nibbles that are on there from the cheeks to the chin. Uh, a lot of cuisines, a lot of cultures eat the eyeballs as well, which I find absolutely delicious. Um, so don't toss it out for certain. It, even if you don't want to put it on your plate, well, make a stock with it for very least. I mean, you did pay for it. The animal did provide it for us. So let's use it. So in the cavity of the fish... I've got uh, a few little mandarin orange slices, one of the great treats of winter that just came out. I went to, and did a major stock up shop yesterday and got a whole bunch of mandarins that come out. Meyer lemons as well, the great citrus fruit of the season. Uh, so I've got a couple of thick slices of that uh, that I just shoved into the cavity. And I've got some ginger, just fresh ginger, some slices of it. Now all of this is all this is gonna do is help to add aroma to permeate the fish as it kind of steams there. So just some ginger, <coughs> excuse me. And then again, I was talking about those big, hearty, heavy flavors that I really like. Ooh, rosemary, here you go. So fresh picked out from the garden there. There was a, yeah, I was chasing off a hawk from my chickens and picking herbs in preparation for all of this. And hey, it's 2020, that's life, right? So. For the salt crust. Now, none of, I'm sorry, going back a second, none of these ingredients are necessary. You can just simply salt bake with nothing else on it. These are just flavors and showing you how to incorporate things. And there's no hard and fast recipe for this. If you've got a quarter lemon left over from last night's cocktails, throw it in there. 
if you've got some lime, throw it in there. Hey, do you really like bay leaves like I do? Throw some bay leaves in there. It's what it is. Basically, you can't go wrong. So try out some things that you might think will go really right. All right. So the salt for the salt crust. Now, this is kosher salt. Uh, I use the, uh, the Diamond Crystal brand. Um, the Morton salt, the, the brown, the blue dot, the, the, yeah, the blue box is perfectly good. Now I use kosher salt simply because it's a voluminous salt for the amount of sodium that is being delivered so that, well, you just have more volume to work with. And I like that from across the board. Now this is getting away from salt resting. Let's just talk about salt for a second here. There's a lot of really sexy salts out in the world from Himalayan salt, black lava salt, you know, super sexy flaked salt harvested by, just, you know, virginal teens, uh, you know, on, on the plains of France. I mean, I mean, it's crazy what you can get into uh, in terms of like, like various marketing ploys on it. But bottom line is salt is salt in terms of the way we use it to season and to flavor. Seasoning is a physical act. So I always use the very same salt, always, so that the act is always the same. So if I'm looking at a piece of fish that's this big or a piece of fish that's this big, I know exactly how much salt that is. So I know how much that is. So I know how much that is too, right? So you can begin to get a real physical memory uh, of how to season things to your liking. So that's why I use kosher salt. Now, to prepare it for this, you can, a couple of ways, one of which is you can whip some egg whites and then fold the salt into that, and that kind of helps to form that case. Or you can do, uh, what I've done is I've added just a little bit of water to it, and uh, I'm gonna add a little bit more. Some of you may have seen me drink from that glass. Yes, I put it in here. Guess what? I'm cooking for myself and my family, so yeah. Anyway, I do acknowledge. So what you want it to do is to look just like wet sand so that it barely compacts. Uh, I'm gonna add just a little bit more. And that moisture is just gonna hold the salt together, but also help to uh, moisten the fish within. Now, you're going to basically serve it on the pan that you're cooking it in. So select a nice pan. Any of you who've joined me before have seen this pan before. This is a little 14 inch uh, cast steel pan. It's, it's beautiful. The, the brand is Staub. Um, no, I'm not marketing for them or paid by them or anything, but just it's a great pan and my go-to. And one of the reasons why I really like the 14 inch pan is, well, any of you who've been with me before, you know that my best friend is, aha, voila, the toaster on that. There it is. This fits perfectly in my toaster oven, so it's an all-purpose pan. So take a little bit of the salt and form a bed on which the fish is going to rest. Place the fish on the rosemary. You can put some of it in the cavity, anything you want. But all that rosemary is going to get uh, discarded with the salt when you go to serve it. And then take the rest of the salt and... Just pack it on. That's it. You don't. It's it's no more technical than that. But you do want to have the fish virtually completely covered, and you want a relatively thick layer of the salt on there as well. Now this is about. Uh, well, let's see. I used about two pounds of salt for a eh, pound and a half fish here. So generally. If you're doing a meal for four, think about the fact you're probably going to use four pounds of salt, five pounds of salt. Um, now your arteries might be screaming right now, but uh, that's not a bad thing. All the salt is going away into the trash. Yes, it seems like waste, uh, and to some extent it is, but the result is worth it. I'm going to wash my hands. Excuse me one second. And then... In a highly technical process, I'm going to take this fish, which has now been coated in salt. Now, you can see there's little bits that are open. 
technically you shouldn't do that, I'm okay with it. It doesn't, it's not going to affect it that much. And if it just means that the salt is going to fall off the plate and you're going to have trouble getting it on there, just, you know what, man, just don't stress about cooking. The first ingredient in any meal is you, right? So if you're stressed, that's going to end up in your meal too. So don't stress about things. Like what's it, what's it, what Patrick, what is that? Uh, Hakuna Matata. Yeah. It's a good, it's a good reasonable motto for life. So I've got, uh, the oven, the broiler on a little bit. So I've got the broiler on to about low and then I've got the, uh, I've got a dual heat oven here and then I've got the oven on to about 375. So that's going to take about 25 minutes or so for that size fish. Generally, you're thinking about one and a half pounds to two pounds of fish is about 25 to 30 minutes and then five minutes or so for every half pound thereafter. And that's not a hard and fast rule, but it should read at a, a, a thermometer, uh, instant read thermometer should read about 130 degrees in the thickest part of it uh, when pierced. All right. So there's that. So I'm going to... Uh, set that aside and I'm going to come over here and I'm going to take a question from you. So, hi there. I've always thought holding fish in milk for a day or two after purchase would keep it fresh, but I think that the lactic acid co cooks it too much. Is there a better way to keep fresh purchases fresh if you cannot use them on the same day? From Sarah. Hey Sarah, great question. I thank you for joining me too. It's a, a new name I haven't seen pop up before, so welcome. Uh, storing fresh fish, I'm going to talk about a couple things. The first is a buying fresh fish. Uh, so learn learn how to identify it. The very best thing that you can do in order to buy fresh fish is to create a relationship with the person you are buying fish from. It doesn't have to be a deep relationship, but one in which that person feels a sense of responsibility for your dinner, for what you are taking home, right? Because personal responsibility is going to get you that. Just introducing yourself by name is going to, and asking their name saying, hey, I appreciate you, it's going to get you pretty far. You also have to be willing to accept the answers when you ask, hey, what's the freshest thing you've got? And if you were coming in there to buy a snapper and they say, well, not the snapper, you, you got to go with them on this. Don't buy the snapper, right? Get the black sea bass or the pollock or whatever else it is. In terms of storing, though, once you get it home, uh, Sarah, put it on a, a tray wrap it in plastic wrap or leave it uh, exposed with just a, a little bit of paper towel, a damp paper towel over top and put it in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the coldest part of your refrigerator. If this is a drawer at the bottom, do that. Or if it's all the way in the back, what you want to do is avoid temperature swings. When you open that door, what are you doing? You're sucking a lot of cold air out just by momentum of the doors, right? So if it's sitting right in the front, it's going to go through that wild temperature swing. You don't want that. Bury it in the back. Don't forget about it. Bury it in the back. Put it in a drawer. Just keep it as cold as possible. Bottom line is good quality fish, when you buy it at the store fresh, is going to last several days in your fridge. And it should. And if it doesn't last that long, then rethink where you're buying your fish from or how you're judging that quality from the outset. Also, of course, think about frozen seafood, a very good option these days. Very, very high quality and uh, good opportunities there for a diversity of species. And in terms of, Sarah, your specific question about or, or comment about holding in milk, uh, that is very classic New England. Uh, that lactic acid does, in fact, sort of help to uh, mitigate the oxidative effects of being exposed to oxygen. Uh, but you're right. The lactic acid does cook it. Um, in the way that ceviche is cooked, it denatures the proteins and changes the flavor of it. Um, plus, then you're not ever going to get a good sear on it because you have, well, you have more moisture on it. You also have milk proteins that have been deposited on it. So the best thing to do, keep it cold, keep it in the back fridge, buy good fish. So complicated answer for a relatively simple question. But hey, Sarah, thanks so much. Appreciate you. All right, another question from Christina. Christina, what are the very best fish for cooking whole? Saltwater fish. Uh, well, that's a good uh, uh, distinction there. Saltwater fish being best for whole roasting. The reason why is that it has to do with the way that fish in saltwater and freshwater um, uh, manage the saline content in their bloods and bodies. So 
saltwater fish take in salt, just as we all do, all things do. Um, it, it's needed for survival. So, but saltwater fish uh, take in salt uh, through their gills uh, and through what they eat. Freshwater fish take in salt through their bodies and the osmosis process that goes in through the skin. So because there's so much water transfer between the skin and the inside, other flavors that are in the water can end up in the fish. This is why if you've ever had muddy flavored catfish uh, or, you know, a carp, which just didn't taste acute, it just kind of has that broad, somewhat muddy algal flavors to it. That's why is because freshwater fish can have that. And when you whole roast them, especially like in salt, that can tend to amplify those flavors. That's why I like to use saltwater fish best. Um, so when you're talking about pan fish, black sea bass, scup, also known as porgy, jolthead porgy, of course, the entire snapper families, some groupers, although the issue with groupers is that their skin can be very bitter. So you need to skin the groupers before you whole roast them. Uh, smaller salmon are fabulous, especially uh, pink salmon, smaller kita salmon, sockeye salmon, and I've got one over here. Uh, those can be a little bit bigger, but you want fish that tastes like something, that has some elegance to its plate presence to begin with. Um, because this salt roasting technique kind of amplifies and accentuates existing flavors, any off flavors will thus also be magnified, amplified, but you want that characteristic, that charm, that ebullience of the fish to be what you're really augmenting first and foremost. So pick a fish you really like to eat in other preparations and then roast them whole. All right. So with that, I'm going to talk to you about another dish that I've got here, and this is just about done. So I'm going to turn the temperature, the heat off on this, and I'm going to uh, pick up my phone here, which I'm talking to you on, and maybe somewhat awkwardly, so please forgive me. Uh, show you into the pan. Y'all ever seen one of these pans, right? Yeah, they're available at yard sales everywhere, right? Yeah, because, well, you think you're going to use one, and then you get one maybe, and then they just kind of sit around. So if you're looking for one of these, a fish poacher, yard sales are a really great place to go. In fact, I have three of them just because I go to yard sales in the neighborhood, and uh, I keep finding them, and they don't sell, and then people are like, oh, you're the fish guy and they give them to me. So it's a long pan, so you can see the length of my arm here. And what I've got in here is a whole pollock. Now I've cut off the head and roasted and poached that separately from the whole body here. And I've left the skin and scales on. And one of the great advantages of the poaching pan is A, it is the size and shape of a fish, uh, but also that it comes with this very handy little raft, um, which you can pull up, the rack, I should say, which you can pull up so that you can get the fish out of there in good form and shape. So I'm going to put my phone back down and tell you about the court bouillon or the poaching liquid uh, that I'm working with here. Let's see if I can not show you the dirty side of my kitchen. That would be great because 2020 dishes, they never go away. You're never done, right? And so for these webinars, I always put a lot of effort in like cleaning up this side. And what does that make that side look like? <laughs> the, the neglected side. So I'm trying not to show you that, right? This is reality. So in the poaching liquid, you can throw in any flavors that you want into this. Um, in this one right here, again, I was thinking about autumnal flavors, the richness, the things we're looking for right now. So I've got uh, about three cups of white wine. Uh, and maybe Patrick, uh, Patrick is my colleague at Ruby, who is behind the scenes man. Uh, I'm speaking to him now. Patrick, if you could maybe uh, write down these ingredients as I write them or as I receive, uh, reel them off and then put them into a comment, that would be wonderful. If not, um, you just write it home. So I've got about three cups of white wine uh, and I use like a Sauvignon Blanc, something acidic. I've got about three cups of apple cider because... Apple cider. We've got it in our fridge, and it's delicious, and it's a flavor of the season. My house smells really, really good right now. I've got bay leaves. Any of you who have joined me before know that I love me some bay leaves. I also love me some fennel seeds. 
So there's um, about 10 bay leaves or so in here. There's about a half cup of fennel seeds. Now, for any of you who are thinking that sounds like a lot and very expensive, well, fennel seeds and bay leaves are just about the same price to buy a pound of them off the internet as they are to buy four ounces of them at the store. And when you buy a pound of bay leaves, it comes in a big bucket. And there's thousands of them. And so it just lends itself to cooking with abandon with them. I mean, it's literally like 16 bucks, I think, I pay for really good quality ones. So do that. Give bay leaves away to your neighbors because you will have plenty. But highly recommend uh, stock up on that. So bay leaves, fennel seeds as well. Uh, I've got a Meyer lemon that I chunked up and threw in there. I've got some fennel stalks uh, from just something I had sitting around and put in some ginger as well. Just one little knob of ginger sliced up. So that's a flavor combination that I really like. But again, there's no way to, you're not going to go wrong with this. I, I mean, yeah, don't put, don't put kiwis and bacon and cinnamon and a couple of Tylenol in there. D don't do that, right? Just if you go with the ingredients you like, you're not going to screw it up. So with that, uh, let me grab a, you shouldn't really cook with Tylenol to begin with. Just nothing against Tylenol. Just anyway. I'm telling a little wacko today. I haven't slept much. I had a three-year-old, three-month-old son. Yeah, we're hitting that phase. I've also got some onion in here as well. So if you can see, I am pulling up that whole, you know what? I got a sheet tray over here and I'm gonna use, excuse me. Got limited space because I'm working with you here on the camera, so. All right, so I've got a sheet tray here that I'm gonna transfer this to, and I'm just pulling this up gently and slowly. No reason to try and jerk it out of the pan. Hmm. I'm gonna transfer that right over there. Now I've got all of that cuisson or the fish broth that is in there. It smells absolutely delightful. And what I would do as a sauce for this, there's a number of different ways you can serve this. My favorite way to do it is to serve it chilled. Yes, this is table ready as it is right now. And I'm going to move this over a little bit so you can see it. So this is table ready at the moment. Uh, but you know what? I like to actually just leave it in the broth to cool down. Uh, let it cool down all in itself. Don't remove it out. Uh, and I'll do that outside. I live in Maine. It's a big refrigerator outside for much of the year, if not a freezer. So I'll do that and just let it cool down in the liquid. Uh, the If you use a thermometer, this has been in for about 50 minutes, 45 minutes, and this is a whole pollock. And I'm putting it down right through the lateral line until I reach the backbone. And at the backbone, the temperature I'm getting is 125 degrees, and that is perfect. And what that's going to do is that's going to carry over cooking. The heat that is, is hotter on the outside of the fish is going to push onto the inside and continue to cook that at a really slow, beautiful rate. If I were cooling this down in the liquid, I would have pulled it out maybe 10 minutes prior at about 115 and just let it continue to cook in that hot liquid. Serve it the next day. Fish served chill poached is one of my very favorite things. It's a, a really bright, acutely flavored um, way to, to handle fish. Uh, it's also, well, hey, if you're cooking for a crowd, cook yesterday for a crowd today, right? I mean, don't stress yourself out, as I said earlier. You can do a really elegant preparation on this on a nice big platter. You just pull it out of the fridge a couple hours before you go to serve it, glaze it again with olive oil or with some mayonnaise, some cucumber slices to mimic scales, etc. Uh, or what I tend to do is make a vinaigrette. Take some of the poaching liquid, uh, remove it, boil it down till it's a, a little bit thicker and the viscosity and the, the flavor is what you want of it. Mix it with whole grain mustard, 
uh, pistachio oil, um, almond oil, a light, bright flavored olive oil. You don't want that deep, grassy richness to it, just the buttery, soft flavors. Um, I also, I've neglected to mention that in my cooking broth, I've got some onions. Now I left the stem intact as well as the top intact mostly. And so what this allows me to do is, well, I've got an onion cut just as you would if you were going to dice it, right? And because I wasn't cooking this at a boil, well, it just gently cooked. So now I can dice it the same as you would if you were starting a dish with it and use that as your vinaigrette as well. So, hey, this is a really elegant, fun way to cook it. And when you go to remove it, and I didn't get a platter, so I'm a little behind on this. I, as I mentioned, I do have the head. And this is a very delicate thing. Um, this is not really going to make it till tomorrow. So, hey, you're the cook. You did all the work, right? You enjoy this. You get the little chin bite here, the eyeballs if you're interested. You've got the tongue area, the very gelatinous rich area just underneath um, between the, the two uh, jaws there. There's a lot of really great, really tasty meat in there. And if you're cooking the whole thing, again, you've already invested in it, right? You've, it's, it's a fun way to, to get something new and different and interesting. So with the Pollock, I did not scale it. And if you're doing a fish like a salmon or a Pollock or a cod, flounder, things like that, you really don't need to scale them because the moisture is going to break down those scales into something that you're really not going to be able to, there's not going to give it some texture. Also, you're very likely going to be removing the skin. And to remove the skin... All I'm doing here is I've got a thin fish spatula and starting from the tail, working towards the head. Very gentle, smooth motions. Just you want to lift and allow it to glide under and you can just peel off large sections of it. And it's no harder than that. And just take your time, you know, you can, you don't have to get it all off in one big section. So if it's not coming off that way or easily, great, just do it in small sections, but you want to leave the meat as much intact as you can because that is your presentation. Right. So the other side of the fish, yeah, I'm gonna leave the skin on that because why even bother trying to take it off? And yeah, you could put your platter, if you are gonna invert this, Peel this side, put your platter over top, pick up the whole thing, and flip it over. Right? That's the easy way to do it. Don't try and pick this up with spatulas and do that. You're going to look like a fool like I just did. Your fish is going to fall apart in seven and a half pieces. And, yeah, so either don't invert it because it's perfectly fine the way it is, or put the pan on, put the plate on top, and then do it. Hmm, little fennel seeds. So I'm going to pick, oh, and by the way, your hands will get deliciously, uh, deliciously gelatinous. So there's your whole fish. And this is an Atlantic Pollock. Um, traditionally, this can be done with cod. This can be done with uh, salmon. Obviously, it's very traditional, especially in French cuisine. Let's see, there we go, at the right angle especially in French cuisine. In fact, I was going to be doing a whole poached sockeye salmon uh, for you on screen today, but uh, it arrived uh, a little bit late to get it thawed out. Um, so thank you to my friends up at the Alaska Seafood Marketing for sending those along. And I'm going to show you that in a second. We'll do a couple more questions here. Um, and I'll show you that, but those arrived frozen. And while you can absolutely poach from frozen, I just wasn't going to be able to cook it in short enough time to be able to show it to you. So uh, I've got some delicious, delicious pollock that's coming from my friends at Harbor Seafood. Um, let's see. I'm back now. There we go. I'm going to wash the gelatin off my hands. I'm going to take a question. I'll be right back. Excuse me. Oh, hey folks, I'm back. Nice to see ya. All right. Hey, Patrick, I see that you put up those ingredients. Thank you so much for that. 
All right. What are the do's and don'ts to stuffing whole fish from Tanya? Hey, Tanya. Thanks for joining us. Uh, the do's and don'ts of stuffing whole fish are uh, don't stuff it with anything that you don't want to taste, uh, don't want to look at if it's done, when it's done. Um, is very expensive because uh, you're not typically going to eat what you're stuffing it with. So think about things that are relatively inexpensive that will flavor, that are highly aromatic. Uh, because what you're doing is you're uh, aromatizing the fish with them rather than adding the ingredient necessarily to the dish on the fork. So you're really looking at aromatic ingredients. Don't fill it full of truffles. Just don't spend the money on it. You don't need to do that. You put the troubles on top if you want to. That's perfectly delicious. Uh, so, Tanya, I'd say those are the do's and don'ts of cooking whole fish. I'll just check. Uh, ooh. Hey, that looks great. I'm going to give that another few minutes. It's been in there for about 20. So, all right. Another question from Sarah. Hi again. Trying to be vegetarian, but have but have to have fish or Thai food once in a while for the lovely intense flavors. Is there a way to make my own fish sauce? Not block, I think. Yes, there is. Uh, Sarah, making fish sauce has, has been a point of contention in my marriage. I'm just going to put it that way. It's not a, um, not a gentle process in terms of its impact on your immediate ecosystem, as in your house will stink big time. So making fish sauce, squid sauce, whatever it is, involves taking whole fish uh, and guts and entrails in and fermenting them in salt and generally in sunlight. Yes, you can do this in a clay vessel, um, you know, like an amphora or something like that, a, a clay crock. Uh, but you're going to smell it. It's going to take process. It takes about three months or so to really do it right, up here at least, in Maine, where it's a little colder. Um, and quite honestly, uh, the result, I've done this lots of times, and I have not been able to produce a result that I liked more, significantly more than what I could buy. And when it comes to the marital strife, that a fermenting, rotting pot of fish in your mudroom causes. Cost-benefit analysis here goes with the uh, $3.69 jar that's available at the store. I mean, that's just kind of... That's where we ended up on it. Uh, I would say I would check out uh, an Italian uh, ingredient, which is pretty much the same thing has a slightly more elegant flavor that I found, uh, which is called garum, G-A-R-U-M. And garum uh, is a classic uh, a Roman sauce, uh, but it, it is the liquid that is exuded and removed from the process of curing anchovies, like the cans of anchovies that you see, the Tento brand, the Roland brand, whatever they are. It's, it's a crystal clear, beautiful, dark-hued, amber liquid, uh, not as aromatic, but deep, rich, ebullient in its flavor. Uh, I won't say one is better than the other, but just, hey, if you're going to check them out, uh, if you're going to use just a few drops of something, yeah, you're right, that's the way to go. Um, you get all that big, intense flavor. So, hey, thanks, Sarah. Appreciate you. All right, another question from Steve. Hi, Steve. Why cook whole fish in salt? Salt draws water from the fish, and thus the fish is all dry. The benefits? Well, Steve, you're right. Salt is a humectant, meaning uh, it draws moisture towards it. Uh, but it also uh, has the, the ability to intensify flavors. And when you cook the salt crust with... Um, a little bit of water or egg white in it, what it does is it forms a cake that becomes generally impermeable to the moisture being released uh, from the encasement here. And so what you end up having is the salt is, well, uh, historically, after salt was very valuable, salt became, I mean, it's a commodity. It's relatively cheap. Yes, you could do this with flour if you wanted to and egg white. You don't get anywhere near the flavor intensity as you do with salt. Um, so, yes, you're right. When you use salt, 
sprinkled on top of things, you draw moisture out of them. When you use salt uh, as a crust, you actually help uh, intensify uh, and add flavor to it. So, thanks, Steve. Appreciate your uh, appreciate your your question. So, I'm going to have to put on pause one second because, well, Patrick asked me this question beforehand, but my phone is actually running out of juice, so I need to uh, figure out how to do that. I will figure that out then. Um, excuse me, one second, ten seconds, please. Oi, 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 oi. Well, folks, this is embarrassing. I'll just say it. Sorry about this. But anyway, as I said, 2020, it's the reality of things. So please forgive me. I'll do better next time. If I can even get this plugged in. So there's a thing that chefs say that the uh, you know the most important thing in any kitchen is is your mise en place, right? Having everything set up, having a plan, having everything ready to go. I failed on that today. So anyway, apologize for that, Patrick. You're going to laugh at me endlessly for this. I know. Hey everyone, we're back. All right, from Judith, what varieties of fish are best and easiest to debone before cooking? Um, softer boned fish, Judith, thank you for your question. Softer boned fish, uh, things like uh, flounder, uh, trout, salmon, especially, uh, where you can cut through the belly cavity of the fish, uh, cut the rib bones away from their backbones easily. Uh, and then sort of butterfly the fish open in that way and then remove uh, the bones from the pin bones that insert that stick into the flesh. So those would be the ones I recommend. However, on a Pollock, uh, on a cod, on a snapper, you can certainly do that. But I would recommend a pair of good kitchen scissors. Go in through the belly, uh, through the cavity, identify where those rib bones meet the backbone, and use the scissors, good strong clips, to snip them off right where they meet that backbone. And then use a sharp knife to continue to um, open up the fish so that you can access those bones. Uh, and then I'm assuming the purpose of this is to then roll it back up so it looks and cooks like a whole fish again. So I hope that helps. Thanks, Judith. Appreciate your, uh, your question. All right. From Alexander. Hey, Chef. Chef Ross is from L.A. Hey, buddy. Nice to see you. What is your favorite fish to cook and why? Thank you. All right. Well, my very favorite fish to cook is bluefish. I just I love me some bluefish. Uh, it's my son's favorite fish. Uh, I just love it for its flavor, its intensity. Uh, it is a, a wicked fish as well. I just admire greatly the bluefish in its vivacity and its life. Uh, as well as on the plate. Uh, so I'm just kind of enamored of the bluefish. And, uh, you know, if you want to, I'm going to shamelessly self-plug here, but I've got a book called American Seafood that I wrote, which is a, uh, a treatise on every single species of fish landed in the United States with my sort of culinary commentary on it, as well as um, ideas about cooking it. But bluefish is, uh, as well as its history, bluefish is just a beautiful fish. They're, they're gorgeous, and they are as, uh, yeah, that's my, my favorite. And they just, they're so versatile. They, they're aromatic and fresh flavored. Now, bad bluefish is, it's about the worst. So uh, you got to eat it fresh, but smoked, basil, walnuts, ginger, soy sauce, garlic. These are all ingredients that just make it sing. Uh, just incredible, incredible pairings with it. So with that, but I also really like, uh, you know, even though it's America's favorite fish, salmon, uh, you, you might find it to be ubiquitous and sort of the go-to fish, but I find it to be such a compelling category of fish as well. Uh, there's the five wild Alaska species from the, the big 
uh, king salmon, you have incredibly rich, deep red, robust sockeye salmon, you have kita salmon, uh, which is where a lot of the salmon roe comes from, the roe production, which are beautiful, uh, softly flavored, but still tensely textured. You have the small and diminutive pink salmon, uh, as well as the silver bright or the coho salmon. Just, I mean, I, I'm just kind of describing to you the way I can describe Pinot Noir. Hey, there's Burgundian Pinot Noir, and then there's Sonoma County Pinot Noir, and then there's Highlands Pinot Noir, Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. It's sort of salmon has that same uh, nuance to me and character from farm sustainably farmed salmons the world over. Uh, all have different characteristics to them, the five wild. So to me, it's an exciting category, even though we think ourselves so familiar with it. And with that, actually, let me get back to the salmon. Um, and the last method that I wanted to show you, and this here is that sockeye salmon, which I was telling you about, which came to me, uh, well, and by via FedEx just today. Uh, truly gorgeous, gorgeous fish. And uh, it's come, you see it's dripping here. It came with a glaze of ice on the outside to help protect the skin uh, as well as the flesh. And that's just to provide a barrier to the cold. You want that layer to be intact. You don't want to see ice crystallization. You want to see that solid sheath of ice. If you see crystallization, what that means is that it's thawed and refrozen, thawed and refrozen. You don't know how many times. But when you see that solid sheath of ice and those just removed in those sheets, that, you know, is a very high quality product. Um, and gosh, these are just gorgeous. Is this sockeye? Okay. Um, so anyway, we've got uh, the other method that I wanted to show you for this. And I'm going to move things over here. And then I'm going to crack the salt crust on this is the last thing is foil wrapped salmon. Uh, now foil wrapping is a, um, a very popular technique. It sort of fits the one sheet pan, one dish, one pot meal. Uh, and it's popular because you, well, you don't have to uh, clean up as much afterwards, right? And that's a good thing. So with such a big fish though, with its head on, uh, you're gonna need a couple of run out of space here really is what the, the problem is a couple of very large pieces of foil now i'm going to lay these down two pieces on the bottom and then around those two pieces uh, i guess what i should do is this sort of lay those over so that it's sort of pedaled over. And then another one smack in the middle. And then you want to put down your aromatics. Now, again, I've got just some things from the garden here. I've got some uh, chopped fennel. I've got a, uh, a basically kind of like a holiday bouquet. Again, thinking about those big, robust flavors, I've got some sage in here. I've got some rosemary, some parsley, uh, last sprig of tarragon for the year as well. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shove those right into the belly cavity of the fish, and that's going to aromatize the fish as well. I'm going to shake off all the rest of that ice sheath that's been on the outside protecting the fish. Lay the whole fish on top of your aromatics. Excuse me a second. And then I'm going to season it, and I'm going to drizzle it with a little bit of oil. Now, as I was mentioning before, why season this but not season others? It's because as the moisture uh, rises, hits the foil package, and then falls back down onto the fish, it's going to season those juices with the salt and just add a little bit of flavor, intense augmentation, intensification. I've got a couple more oranges, those little mandarins, just because I've got them and it's nice and seasonal. And, hey, and that's also just really beautiful. And uh, I'm gonna pick up the phone again.
see if I can't bring you over here. So there's your fish. A couple of layers of foil underneath. You've got some fennel underneath the fish as well. And then um, we're just going to wrap this over, sort of cinch the ends and uh, kind of create an imper a, a packet that's going to trap the moisture in there. Um, let's see. A packet that's going to trap the moisture in there and keep it delicious. So with that, I'm going to work on this. I'm going to take a couple more questions. Um, let's see. Uh, from Sarah, another question. Hey there, I use a lot of lemon zest with fish. If zest all my lemons and keep the zest and silicone in the freezer, is that food safe? Is there a better way? Um, hmm. I, I would first ask, uh, I mean, understanding COVID and, and modern shopping that we are shopping a lot more in bulk these days, but I would first ask why you are zesting that many lemons to begin with um, instead of just buying them uh, fresh and kind of using them up. Uh, but in terms of food safety, I don't see any issue with that uh, by any means. I'm, I'm not a, a food safety expert. I've certainly gone through my, my rigorous trainings and all that, but... Uh, I don't see where there could be any issue with that. I would say, though, that you're going to lose a lot in terms of the uh, the volatile oils, which are really the flavor and zest more than anything else that really add to things. You're going to lose a lot of that nuance of flavor in the freezing process. Um, so I might say, in addition to that, because uh, you don't want to be without your lemon zest, so certainly keep doing that, but I would um, put some in oil. Uh, you know, if you're if you're zesting it fresh, put a little ball jar or something, you know, a little one cup thing, fill it with olive oil at room temperature and put your zest in there and then use the oil as your sort of vehicle, your medium to getting the zest onto the onto the fish. The other thing that I would recommend if you dig that idea is check out a product online called Agrumato, A G R U M A. T O agrumato. What that is is it's olive oil that is not um, uh, macerated on lemons. It is olives that have been pressed into olive oil with lemons in the pressing process. So all made together. So it's not it's not olive oil that is scented with lemons. It is lemon olive oil. Oh. My lord, is agrumato delicious. There's also lime, there's orange, there's blood orange agrumatos. Um, they can be a little expensive, but you only need just a little bit of. But in terms of the intensity, uh, the acuity of flavor, and the punch per drop that you get out of it, it is incredible. So thanks, Sarah. Appreciate it. All right. So... I'm going to say, actually, and I'm just going to admit my ignorance here. I don't see a whole lot of whole Alaskan salmon uh, on the East Coast here without the heads on, etc. cetera, um, just because of shipping, because of process and all that. And I tend not to have them for those sustainability reasons. But what was sent to me today, so I believe that this is actually a Kita salmon, uh, just judging by its... Uh, its, its length and its shape. And if anyone from ASME is on or anyone that can uh, better identify that, I can't actually bring the phone much closer. Um, I, I would love to know, but I'm going to say that that is a keto salmon. So anyway, who knows? You know what? Even experts are ignorant, right? I mean, hey, we all have something more to learn. So that'll be my next thing to do. Anyway, so I'm going to keep going on this and I'm going to take another question. From Judith. Hi there. How are you boys? Have they started eating fish yet? <laughs> uh, yes, Judith. Actually, if you follow me on Instagram, uh, and I know some of those also filter over to Facebook, uh, you will see some recent photos of my kid squid, my eldest, Alden, um, mowing down on some squid squid. He, uh, his favorite fish is bluefish, second favorite fish, salmon, and he loves him some squid, especially off the grill. And he puts the tentacles um, on his fingers and thinks he's really funny and then just kind of munches them off. And it's like, wow, yeah, <coughs> I guess we made fish cool in this house, huh? For real. But yes, he loves it. And uh, little Rosie, little Rosie, Ambrose Lee, we call him Rosie. Uh, he's not uh, he's not yet eating fish, but but he will be. 
and mama's eating a lot of fish, so all those omegas, those heart-healthy, fatty-rich omega-3 fatty acids are going right into him through her breast milk, and she is, wow, you can see the wheels in this kid's mind growing and turning. Omega-3s, people, very healthy for you, very important, especially for kiddos. All right. Uh, it's a sockeye. Hey, Sarah Kennard, thank you so much for, <laughs> for responding. So, okay. Hey there. I appreciate expertise where expertise pops up. Thank you for that, Sarah. All right, sockeye. It's delicious. It's the most beautiful sockeye I've ever seen that I did not catch myself in a river. I will say that. And, yeah, it's a frozen fish. So, wow. Cool stuff. All right. Um, oh, Sarah, now you're, you're bailing me out here. I like that. It can be very tricky for even the most experienced fishermen to tell a fisherman what the, the kita fish are on a larger size. So never feel bad about being uncertain. Well, thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that uh, get-out-of-jail-free card. But uh, I also appreciate expertise when it is offered. So thank you so much for, for chiming in. All right, from Brenda. Did you mention the oven temp for salt baking? No, I didn't. I'm sorry. Uh, 375 is what I like to do. Uh, and I've seen people go higher than that, um, even significantly higher, up to 450 with a convection. And what you're going to get with that, especially if you use some egg white, in the mix instead of water, is you're gonna get some coloration on the salt, um, some uh, browning to it that is very attractive coming out of the oven, especially if you're plating it up in the restaurant, serving it whole at the table side. That can be a very attractive thing to do. You don't necessarily lose a whole lot of quality. It cooks faster, certainly, um, but I like 375. I like to give myself some leeway. Hey, if the glass of wine was a little too heavy, you know, on the pour, and I'm over here for an extra five minutes or so. At 450, you're gonna you're gonna lose track of your fish quick. At 375, you get a little bit more leeway. Give yourself a break. So there's that. So with that, I'm gonna touch the pan that just came out of the oven at 375, right? So I like to let it sit, just as you rest meats, roasts, things like that. Uh, let this sit, uh, and then. Crack the salt crust, and I'm going to admit another uh, shortcoming here. I didn't actually add enough water to the salt to um, to get it exactly right. Uh, this should just crack off in big flaky pieces, and the salt that's on the bottom closest to the flesh shouldn't be still um, granular. So I'm just going to admit to that. Uh, I'm also going to bail myself out a little bit by saying it, it's hard to get salt right when you live 50 feet from the ocean and the tide is doing things and the air is very moist. So anyway, I'm just, just trying to explain myself, make myself feel better. But um, even if that is the case, don't worry about that because that salt can still be easily just brushed aside. Uh and what you end up with is you can see and that won't burn too badly. Um, the the flesh that's here you can see is is super moist. I mean, when I push it, I'm seeing moisture running out of the fillet, and uh, it's. You know, I, I believe it was Steve, to your point, you know, doesn't it dry out the fish? Well, you saw how much salt I used on this. And when you pull it off of the, off of the bone, it's still incredibly moist and delicious and flavorful. You can see the steam rising off of it. And, hey, it's really delicious. Now, with salt, uh, with black sea bass, you're not going to get the skin off of it. The skin is just too thin to really remove but it's also too thin to really give you any textural contrast. So, mm. yep, that's worth eating. My highest compliment. It's worth eating. It's absolutely delicious. So that is a very good quality fish too. Just in order to move the fillets from a salt roasted, what you do is there's a couple of different methods for it, but what I like to do is come just along the backbone, kind of sidled down, and you come down to the, uh, I'm sorry, along the dorsal ridge, 
and you come to the backbone and you just peel the fish off. And if you've got another fork or a large spoon or another spatula, you can get these very large pieces of fish off, pieces of the filet. You're never going to get a perfect whole filet off the fish just as you would with a knife when it was raw. Some people can. I, you know, and I've never put in enough practice in order to do that because I don't find it uh, necessary. I like the rustic approach to this dish. I like that it, it begs us to stop and to consider and to dive in physically into our food. So that's to me is one of the great aspects of it. And I, I don't care to professionalize it to the point where I do away with that. So, all right. So last thing I do want to show you, I am going to take a little bit of Madeira as well, or actually a little, let's say, let's do an Amontillado, Sherry. A couple of drops of that over top. So I've got, again, this sort of Thanksgiving herbs, sage, parsley, thyme, a little bit of um, rosemary and a uh, uh, and tarragon in there. I've got orange slices over top, fennel underneath, a little bit of salt. And then you're just basically making a packet. Uh, wrap it like you would a Christmas present, really. You've got those multiple pieces of salmon, uh, of foil, though. Kind of cinch together that front end. Meet the two pieces of foil in the middle over top and fold those over each other, roll them down to create a barrier. I'm holding a sort of a lock. And there you go. There's your salmon in foil. And there's your there's your whole packet, right? And it's cinched together in the front. Again, it's kind of rolled over at the top. These pieces here are the uh, the bottom pieces that were sort of pedaled out to help for, uh, create a, a more sturdy bottom. And the back end is just folded over as well. And so there you go. There's your whole salmon. And put that on the largest sheet tray that will fit in my oven. I'm just going to throw that in there because my family is going to eat that for dinner tonight. So it obviously won't be done by the time we're done here in just a few minutes. But I did want to show you that I've got the oven. I'm going to turn this down to about 325 uh, for this. Now, those of you who have watched me cook salmon before know that's actually a little bit high, higher than I typically cook salmon. However, that foil is going to trap all that moisture, keep it all together. Keep it delicious. So that will take from frozen probably about an hour and a half. Um, I'll unwrap some of the foil. I'll stick a thermometer in, thermometer in there. I'm going to look for about 125 degrees at the backbone. It is going to take a while. So maybe I'll have a glass of Amontillado. Doesn't that sound good? Yeah, right? All right. A couple more questions. Uh, what's your favorite protein that's not fish from Patrick? Huh. Hmm. Don't really have one. I like sausage. Sausage. Yeah. Uh, beans. Beans are my favorite, Patrick. Uh, I like the variety uh, of beans and lentils, the pulses, the, the legumes. Uh, those are my favorites. Just there's so much variety. There's so much texture to them. They pair so beautifully well with other ingredients, especially fennel, fennel seeds, bay leaves. Uh, I braise, I've got these absolutely beautiful uh, scarlet runner beans that I grow here. I've got a calico Kurzer's lima bean that I really, really love. Um, and I'll, I'll batch up giant jars of those. I'll cook them in some vegetable stock, uh, pressure can them and just have them ready to go. Uh, sometimes I do a uh, like a Trinity flavor, like the New Orleans style, the green pepper, celery, and uh, onion. Simmer that together, sort of sofrito, add that into the jars before I can them. Uh, and then just serve it over rice. So you've got your beans and rice. There's your complete protein. Uh, yeah, that's probably my other favorite. So, but there's not many, not many meals we don't eat seafood in some capacity here around the house. But we do eat vegetarian pretty often as well. So, hey, thanks, Patrick. 
From Linda, can you quickly review the use of broiler and oven? How long under the broiler? How long? Just a quick review. Sure. Uh, so, Linda, again, I have a dual uh, heat, a, a dual uh, unit where I can have the broiler on and the oven uh, separately. I've got a gas oven and an electric broil. And I have the broil set on to low, and I've got the oven on to about 350 or so for the salt butt, salt crust. Um, and I like to do that just so there's a nuance between browning as well as sort of creating that ambient heat. And it's a bit of a, uh, you know, a learning curve for your oven particularly, not just your brand of oven, but your oven particularly and, and how it's set up and airflow and all of that in there. Uh, but if I'm using, if you only have one heat unit at a time, what I like to do is to cook first. So roast first, remove from the oven, set your broiler to high, and then put it back in the oven once it's really ripping up to temp, brown quickly, and get out. Um, so that's the way I like to use sort of that dual heat method. Hey, thanks, Lynn. I appreciate you joining. You're great. All right, another question from Sarah. Hey there. We're new friends, aren't we, Sarah? That's great. Hey. Um, is there a chef's trick to peeling whole garlic cloves without smashing them? It takes me an inordinate amount of time. Thanks. Yeah. All right, Sarah. So... Well, my tactic is that I grow about 1,200 heads of garlic on my farm here. Uh, and I've got, so I've got fresh garlic that I have access to. Fresh garlic is easier to peel. But what I do, I also grow clo larger cloves, not elephant garlic. I don't like the flavor of that. It's fine. I just don't prefer it. Um, music is my favorite. I grow hard neck varieties as well, which have better flavor to me and are easier to peel. But what I do is I will peel it down to that single layer of uh, foil or, or of the wrapper. And then I will not crush it, but I will separate it just with a little bit of pressure. And once you get that skin cracked, then you can peel easily and you can get under it. And really where it holds together is at the base. So start there and kind of work your way around. And if you need to crack it again, but really that's where, it, as I said, it holds together. And you end up with big pieces. And you know what? Yeah, it did take me 20 seconds, 10, 15 seconds. I was talking uh, the whole time. But you know what? Garlic is such a fundamental ingredient. It is so important in terms of when you are using it, that how it affects you, your dish. Take time to do it right. Take time to use the right garlic. Uh, it should take a minute. You know, those jars of garlic that have been sitting in water since they got on a boat from China in 2017, just, just, just don't do that. Just don't do it. And I, it's not that it came from China. It's just that it's so old. It's so oxidized. It's If it's the color of a... Of, of a of a wood stain, don't use it. It's not, it's only gonna make your dish worse. So, but that's again, just a simple uh, crush on the sides of it. So sort of across the equator, <clears throat> so that you're really breaking it. If you crush it this way, sort of on the short way, you're not gonna crack much. If you're going this way, you're going to get some, you're going to get some separation and then just get under it. It's like peeling an egg. Hey, Sarah, thanks. You're asking great questions. I hope you'll join us again. Um, I know that we're right up at time here. I've still got a number of questions left to go, so I'm going to stick around and answer all those. But uh, for any of those who do need to hop off, please follow me on Instagram at Martin Seaver. Uh, check out our seafood literacy course online with Ruby that I'm very proud and pleased to partner on. Uh, please check out some of my books available at booksellers everywhere. They make really great holiday gifts, by the way, as well as study items for you. And, uh, well, otherwise, really, if you do one thing, please just tell somebody you love them today because the world needs a whole lot of that. Express some gratitude. And I expect gratitude for you for joining me. So any of you got to sign off. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. And uh, for the rest of the questions, hey, let's, let's keep going. Okay, from Chris. Oh, hi, Chris. Nice to see your name pop up. Uh, tips on cutting, peeling raw squash without cutting yourself, please. 
left thumb currently in a bandage. Wow, Chris. Um, well, uh, one good thing to do is uh, to get, uh, and I believe that you sent me an email before in which you referenced your husband, uh, so forgive me if that gender isn't right, but uh, get, get him to do it, right? Hey, that's good. It doesn't cut down on the hospital bills, but it helps. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, how to cut squash. Yes. The key to this is creating um, a, a stable surface. Okay, so this is a very small butternut squash. I grow a very tiny uh, little variety called honey nut here on the farm. Um, but if you're using a bigger squash, it's all the same. The first thing I do, well, you know what? I've got an apple here. I'm going to eat an apple because I will eat this. Um, first thing I do is give myself a stable surface to work on. Right? You can't see that. So there you go. That is where your problems arise. If you're trying to cut something that doesn't stay put on the surface, you are pushing yourself against a variable. And if your hand is doing this and trying, if you're trying to hold the squash in place against the force of your knife, you are aiming to cut yourself. If you give yourself a stable surface, now when you push down into the squash, you are pushing the squash by the force of your knife into a stable position, right? I mean, this is, that's where it is. You don't have to cut off much, just enough to stabilize that. Chris, I do this with bagels. I mean, if, if I've got a bagel and here's, you know, the equator of the bagel, I will cut off a tiny section on the side like that again, so I have a stable surface through which to cut my bagel. Because if your bagel's rolling around and trying to roll over, etc., cetera, yeah, you're going to hurt yourself. You are. You know what the other one is that people, you know the number one uh, emergency room call is uh, on Super Bowl Sunday? Anybody know? Hand. Cuts on your hand. Why? People are cutting avocados to make guacamole, and they never cut avocados the rest of the year. And how do you cut an avocado? Pick it up in your hand. Pick up a sharp knife in your other hand, point that sharp knife at your opposite hand, and push, right? So it makes sense that a lot of people end up in the emergency room with guacamole injuries. Anyway, the key to it all, stable surface. Same is true with garlic. I mean, quite honestly, if I'm going to be dicing this clove of garlic, it's going to rock if I do that. So I take off just that much of it so that I've got a stable surface on it. And it helps in everything. Hey, Chris, I appreciate you as always. You're wonderful to doing. All right, from Lisa, could you season the fish from the inside? Yeah, certainly you could. Uh, it's not going to be 100% uh, effective because you're only exposed, the, the flesh is only exposed within the belly cavity. Uh, you know, so nothing from, let's see. Where can you see? There you can see. You know, you can only, the belly cavity only runs from here to here. So you're not going to be able to season anything from this direction. Uh, plus, there is a protective tissue lining the belly cavity that is going to prevent a lot of that salt from really drawing in. Uh, one way that you can do this is to create slashes in the skin as well. So if the skin were still on this and it was raw, just shallow little cuts, long cuts that just barely puncture the surface, and then season, focus on those little slashes, sort of massage the salt in, and it will do its own work to absorb and infiltrate throughout. Hey, thanks so much. I appreciate you joining, Lisa. You're great. All right, from Raul. Hey there, buddy. I love Bronzino and usually have it when at Italian restaurants. Yeah, for the first time I had it in a place where that first fries it to get the skin hard and then cooks it in the oven. How long do you fry it? And what temp would you cook it in the oven? Wow. Yeah, hey, Raul, man, that's sexy. Wow, what a great idea. Um, so I would fry it probably at, at very high heat. Uh, so, well, the first thing I would do is, is pat it dry. I mean, you want it really, really, really dry. You want the belly cavity really, really dry. Get all the way up into under the chin, get the gills out, really, really wash out and dry that out. You don't want to put a fish in, splatter it, you know, oil and water all over the place. So, uh, also scale it. 
which you don't have to do for a salt roast preparation, but you, I would recommend for this. Again, pat it dry, maybe even scrape it with the back side of a knife so you get all of that moisture off. Don't cut the skin, but just scrape it. Fry it at about 375, maybe 400 uh, to really set that crispness to cook it quickly. And Bronzino does cook, uh, the skin will crisp because it has a thick layer of fat, a subcutaneous fat right underneath the skin that will sort of crisp it from the inside as well as from the outside. And then I would throw it in the oven at a pretty low temperature. Uh, you're going to do a lot of cooking from the fryer to get it crisp. So I would just kind of let it sit and roast maybe 275, 300 degrees in the oven. Let it take some time. Put it cavity down so that the skin that you've worked so hard to crisp is still exposed to the air. If you lay it on top of itself, it's just going to steam. It's going to puddle up the juices, etc., and you're going to lose the whole purpose of having fried it. So, hey, Raul, I appreciate you, man. Take care. Um, all right, from Catherine G. Hi, friend. Uh, farm salmon versus wild. Any preference? Uh, yeah. The best quality product that's available to you at the time uh, from a sustainable source. So uh, farm salmon has long had a track record of being seen as an unsustainable choice. However, the industry has made incredible strides towards sustainability to the point where the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Program now has some green ranked, green rated uh, farm salmon, Quare Arctic, uh, among those, uh, for Lasso salmon has long been a leader in this. Um, I, I mean, there, there's some really great advances that are happening in that. Uh, there are feeds that have been introduced that have helped reduce their impact on ecosystems like uh, Veramaris, which is an algal, algal-based feed. I mean, there's just really cool things happening that are also delivering incredible quality product. Uh, that said... Hey, salmon is both farmed and wild. That's, that's the bottom line is that's our world that we live in. And I'm happy about that. Uh, there is wild salmon available year round frozen. I mean, the sockeye that I am dealing with today was the sockeye season just closed recently. So that is a very uh, recently frozen fish. But when you freeze something in a technique called fr uh, fresh frozen, meaning it's frozen within hours after being pulled from the water, uh, it's not a means to stop spoilage. It's a means to arrest pristine quality. I mean, this isn't a, a, an effort to keep it from going bad. It's an effort to deliver it in, in absolute perfect quality, which that fish is. I mean, it's, it's insanely good quality. So salmon, uh, wild salmon from Pacific Northwest, California, but especially Alaska, the legendary and sustainable fisheries there, available year-round frozen, uh, fresh frozen. Uh, but certainly also available fresh throughout the fishing seasons, which really run from uh, generally May through about now uh, with seasonal, with yearly variations. So, uh, yeah, I, it's also up to your preference. So that's sort of, I was speaking to the entire category of salmon. It's all, you can find great stuff in, in any wild or farmed, but you also just think about what you're using it for. Are you making a lox, a grav lox, where you want that silken richness uh, on the palate? Great. Okay. Then you're talking about king salmon. Then you're talking about uh, a wild farm salmon from really cold waters, a place like Norway that's known for having that high fat content, that richness. Are you doing a salmon melt or a salmon cake? Okay. Awesome. You don't need all of that fat. Well, man, a really tasty, uh, you know, wild pink salmon, uh, kita salmon, or sockeye salmon does really well there. And a low-fat salmon, by the way, is not low-fat. It's relative, or it's relatively lower fat, but it's still chock full of omega-3 fatty acids. Any salmon is going to deliver more than the recommended daily allowance or recommended daily dose of, of the omega. So when I say a lean salmon, I mean a delicious, fatty-rich fish any way it comes. Um, so it's really kind of finding what you're going to be using it for and then applying the best salmon to it. And this is the same thing we do with wines. And you're kind of asking, like, hey, do you like red or white wines? Like, yeah, I, yeah, I, I like them. <laughs> They're good. Uh, you can get a Cabernet, you can get a Merlot, you can get a Malbec, you can get a Pinot Noir. I mean, there, there's going to be those differences there. And, and each one is going to have a slightly different use. Hey, all right. Thank you so much. Appreciate the question, Catherine.
Another one, is it possible to substitute parchment paper for the foil? Absolutely. Yes, it is. Um, the foil uh, I'm using here just because I'm using such large sheets of it. Uh, it's a little bit cheaper and easier to uh, put together. I think parchment is, is maybe a little more attractive uh, coming out of the oven, but it can also be less attractive because it, it can discolor and the foil is going to look exactly as it did when I put it in the oven. Uh, there's no difference there really other than the ease of use. Foil is a little bit easier to cinch together because it, it, it holds together better than parchment. Um, you know, admittedly, I'm not as good at using parchment as, as, uh, master chefs. Some master chefs are like, I, 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 I have been known to use a stapler to get my parchment to stick together. There's no shame in that. Just remember where you put the staple and don't eat it. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Paper clips also work. Hey, all right. I've admitted a lot about myself today. Ah, okay. Uh, from Suzanne. Hi, friend. Uh, how would you cook a whole salmon with a layer of stuffing on the top made of a shrimp and asparagus, etc.? Ooh, wow. How cool. Um, how would I do that? I would probably cook the salmon most of the way first. Foil would be good. Uh, so you're going to, you're going to have your leeway. You're going to cook it low and slow. Let it, uh, just take it, let it take its time. Put it in your oven at 300 degrees. I mean, obviously it sounds like you're, you're doing a dish for, for special occasion, for entertaining, uh, something kind of fun, right? Take your time with it. Enjoy it. Low and slow, 300 degrees, depending on the size of the salmon. Yeah, it's going to take some time, maybe up to a couple hours. Uh, but what I would do is when you, an internal temperature reads at about 120 or so, uh, maybe 115 if it's a smaller fish, take it out of the oven, remove your skin, because you're not, you don't want to put the stuffing on top of skin that's not really going to be that delicious. It's going to somewhat detract. Remove the skin, as I did here uh, with this Pollock. Then put your sausage, shrimp, asparagus, stuffing on top. Nestle it in around as well on the bottom to kind of create some support. And then throw the whole thing under the broiler to finish cooking, maybe on low or medium heat under the broiler. It'll take a few minutes, sure, 20 minutes, but that way your salmon and your stuffing are going to cook at the same time. You're not going to add too much moisture to the stuffing from your fish, nor are you going to add, you know, require the fish to overcook because the sort of cook the elements separately, strategically, but on the same dish. Hope that helps. That's the technique that I've used for just using like Thanksgiving stuffing. Uh, for that, though, I would put some in the cavity of the fish when you start off the process. Uh, but if you're just putting it on top, just what I said, but if you are going to put some in the cavity, put that in at the beginning and then follow through. Hey, Suzanne, thank you so much. Appreciate you. All right. I should, hey, Hilda. Nice to see you, man. Pop up, friend. Hey, I always like friends. That's good. Hey, chef, would you ever take off a dorsal fin before cooking? Best regards to the four of you. Well, thank you for remembering the family. Uh, no, uh, to the dorsal fin. I, I don't think there's much reason for that. Uh, you know, if you can see uh, the pollock here, that dorsal fin is just going to, they're just going to pull right out when you're done. Uh, if you cut it before cooking it, you're basically just creating a giant gash and wound in the flesh that's going to leach and exude moisture that you're going to be lost in the process. So I would say no, don't remove it uh, before cooking. After cooking, it is very simple enough to just take a spatula and go in on either side. And there you go. There's the whole dorsal fin. I mean, I, no more complicated than that. Also, I like the gel gelatin that's between the intercostal tissue between those bones. There's some of the taste, some of the very tastiest meat on the entire fish. So I like to leave that in there, especially on flounder, where you have a very long dorsal fin, so you get a lot of that cartilage. Woo -wee. <laughs> it's good stuff. 
All right, Judith, just saying thanks. Hi, friend. I appreciate you. You are very welcome. Sarah, fabulous learning. Hey, all right. Well, look at this. I'm just getting comments and thanks at the end of it. Hey, this has been really great to all of you. I appreciate you. Please join us again. We're going to be doing some really fun things in the coming uh, weeks here. Uh, we're going to get um, some Thanksgiving stuff going on, entertaining for not a crowd in COVID, uh, but still sticking to our holiday favorites. We're going to be talking about Feast of the Seven Fishes. We're going to be talking wines. I'm going to be introducing some new friends. So please check out the upcoming schedules. Follow me on Instagram. And as always, cook with love. Be kind. And uh, with that, I wish you all the best. Take good care, friends.